Hello. Everyone see and hear me? Right, and now, because one of your smart colleagues, I think I can hear you all. Can somebody just unmute and say hello or something? Hello. Thank you. JT, you were right last time. All right, so now if somebody has a question, you can technically unmute. Oh my goodness, my shirt is green screening out. Didn't think that one through. <sighs> Hate that I can't wear green because it's probably my favorite color to wear. <laughs> okay, so welcome back everyone. I hope y'all survived and are doing okay. Um, if you're not and need some moral support, you can always come to me. If you need any sort of resources for counseling, there's a lot of them at UT, especially now via Zoom. So please get you all some help if you need it. <sighs> so while people are still trickling in, I'll just say it like for you all. Like I'm also a student, remember? So yeah, my teachers are also just like, <laughs> here is everything. So I understand why, because I have, like, I'm on both sides, right? I'm a student and your teacher, so I can kind of remember what it feels like to be on both sides. Like, as a student, I'm like, yo, we just survived snowpocalypse and everything. But as a teacher, like, I want to make sure that you get everything that you can. Uh, but unlike some of my teachers, as I mentioned already in the announcement, I'm going to drop two of your lowest quizzes now, and I'm also considering maybe offering like a one point of extra credit for your final grade, but that would have to be done like in a week. And I was thinking about maybe having you write like one page, single spaced, of uh, the whole snowpocalypse adventure. So I wanted it to be something easy for you to do, but something that's reflective. So I'm thinking about that if you all are interested, like I need to hear a roar from the crowd, you know, in the chat or something, because otherwise I'm not gonna add another assignment. It's just more work for me to do too, so. If that's something you're interested in, let me know. doesn't seem like it. So there's still the four points you can get from that extra credit that's really not that hard. Please do. Okay, now everyone's like, yes! <sighs> okay. Now, I'm going to be very clear about this, and I'm going to have to mention it again because of some other assignments. Any of those assignments or this extra credit that all you have to really do is write something and tell me how you feel, if you're only writing one or two sentences, I know I seem kind of mean, but I meant to do, I create these assignments to make them kind of easy hundreds, but I am still grading them. If I say a few sentences, that means more than two, hopefully more than three, and not just, I liked it, it was cool, or it was okay. Like, come on, y'all. I just want you all to think, and I want to hear what you all are thinking, so please actually type something. So if I do this extra credit thing, I don't want you to just say, it was really cold and it sucked. I want you to really reflect and I'll probably, excuse me, give you some prompting questions. And although some of you are probably like, oh, whatever, I'll do whatever I have to to get the point. Um, it'll probably be something kind of cool for you to reflect on 20, 30 years from now, because hopefully this is not gonna happen again anytime soon. And you'll remember this was that crazy time that the whole city broke down <laughs> because we're Texans and we don't know how to do cold. So I will create that maybe in the next maybe tonight or tomorrow, and um, I want it done within a week, like nothing more than that. Okay, and that's just another assignment kind of to do. I'm sorry, but please bear with me. So I'm gonna, hopefully y'all read this, but you'd be surprised how many of you out there don't. So I'm gonna go through this very quickly. So uh, for today, we are gonna cover the first part of module three. And the second part of module three, I already have all, for all those async students and for those of you who want to just look at things twice, I already have all of these videos pre-recorded, so I'm lucky. I don't know if that makes you lucky or unlucky that there's already all the stuff on there. We don't have to be pushed back too much. So I'm going to need you to watch that second video on your own. I am not going to cover the second part in class, like the whole lecture. On Tuesday, next Tuesday, I will give you the opportunity to ask specific questions. Maybe I'll do like one or two kind of hand calculations or R examples, but I already have videos on all of that. There's plenty of videos out there on how to do a Z-score by hand and look things up on the table, which we're gonna talk about today. And all those worksheets, like there's a lot of resources already out there, so I'm not gonna go over that again for the interest of time. Because if we just push and kind of slam for these next two and a half weeks, then we're gonna be back to normal and we'll kind of end class the way I always intend to a little bit early so that you can focus on your other finals. That's how I like to do my classes. So I don't wanna to have to push everything back a week because then 
this will be looming over you during your finals. And I don't want, I want this class to be over basically before finals. So we are going to slam a little bit for these like two or three weeks, but it's going to be, and you're also not going to have anything like due necessarily like right after spring. I have a test after spring break. So annoying. So you're not going to have any of that for this class if we do everything this way. So please bear with me. So yeah, make sure you watch that second video. You're going to need that. Or it's over here. Watch that second video. It's on YouTube. Here's the link it's throughout Canvas. Please find it. Please watch it. It's about 30 minutes also. Um, here are all of the links to all of the worksheets. Again, you can do it in R or in or by hand. Uh, but also to be clear, your R assignments have to be done in R. It's an R assignment. I, some people, I guess, couldn't get the hang of it and try to do it by hand or in a different program, which kudos, but it's an R assignment. So, but for quizzes, you can answer it any way you want. If it's easier for you, just do it by hand. That's fine. If you want to try R, go for it. Um, so class on Tuesday, like I said, I'm going to go over the second part of module three a little bit, like give some time for y'all to ask questions if you want, but otherwise I'm going to start into module four, but we're going to skip sampling. We don't necessarily, it's a fun discussion class. Usually I like to have, but we got to, got to keep going. So if you want to watch that video, you're more than welcome to, but you're not required to, I'm not going to quiz you off anything from there. And we'll just maybe talk about sampling kind of throughout the class. Um, then we'll finish up that sampling stuff if we have to. Um, and maybe I'll leave it up to you all if on Tuesday or on Thursday you want me to show you a little bit of R for your assignment number two, which I think is due on the 14th. You already basically have everything you need to answer it except for two functions, which I list here. And I also, if you shoot me an email because you're like, I can't get it to work after you try, I'm happy to help. Like it's going to be pretty much the exact same for the very beginning. A lot of like histograms and means and things like that. But the two new functions you're going to need are called describe from the psych package. So you have to install that. If you don't know how to do that, go look at the last R video I posted. It's linked somewhere here. And uh, the filter function, which there's an example in that tips PDF on there. What else do we have? Mm, I might have to change due dates and stuff, but I'm pretty sure, I'm not going to guarantee, but I'm pretty darn sure. No, I'm, I'm, I can guarantee. I'm never going to push an assignment forward. I'm only going to push them back at this point. Um, I'm still going to be holding the office hours today after class. So if any of you want to slam through that R assignment, happy to sit here and help you with it. Or if you want to kind of go over a little bit more of the Z, Z score kind of stuff, happy to do that too. I'll also, of course, be having office hours on Tuesday. Janet has hers on Monday and Friday, I think. Um, oh, and so your quiz for module three, I'm sorry, is going to be due next Thursday, but like at midnight. So you'll have today, Tuesday and Thursday, like class time with me and you can stay afterward for office hours to ask more questions, but I need you to do that quickly. And then quiz number four is going to be due next Sunday. I'm sorry. It's just, we need to, once we get that out of the way, it will be kind of back on track and things will kind of start to mellow out again. Um, and like I said, I know this is very daunting and scary and some of you might still be dealing with hardship. Please, if you're one of those, email me. Don't wait till the end of the semester and say, oh, it's because all these pipes burst. Cause I'm sorry to say I've had people lie to me in the past when it's convenient for them, when they realize, oh, I'm about to fail. So please let me know ASAP. So like I said, uh, to make it a little bit nicer, I'm going to drop two of your lowest quizzes since I'm like forcing you to do a couple of them, like kind of fast and back to back. I understand that's not necessarily fair, but that's why I'm dropping a second quiz. So hopefully you find that fair enough. Um, and I'll offer that one point of extra credit, but I really recommend you do that. The actual extra credit from, from the whole behavior modification thing. It's four points. Email me if you have questions. Okay. That took too long and I need to not be wasting time. Were there any questions, comments, or concerns y'all? I'm also happy to chat more after class. If anybody wants to just dish about their crazy experience, I am, I'm here for it. I'm here for you. I had to take in a couple people, which I was happy to do, but I was very happy when everyone left because <laughs> I am an only child and I live by myself and I like my privacy. But for a week there was people living on my couch. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, your quiz will be due on the fourth, which is on next Thursday at midnight. Uh, your tell someone about is still due on Wednesday. Hopefully these assignments aren't too difficult for you. And I also want to be clear that I will take off points if you just 
really aren't saying much. Or if you're just like, I showed them the slides, or I explained variation, I explained standard, standardized scores. I want to know how you explained it. That's why I'm asking you. So please write enough. If you're not writing enough, I'll take off points. But I never take off points if you're actually kind of saying it incorrectly. Like not, I don't expect you to be experts in standardization after this. Um, so if you're saying something incorrectly to your little brother or to your friend, I might correct you in a comment. I comment on a lot of your assignments. Um, but I'm never going to take off points for you explaining something incorrectly. That's not the point of this assignment. OK. Ready, ready? Everybody bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and ready and super excited to get back into stats. Sorry. I don't know how you all feel, but I, part of me is like, I don't want to get back to work. And then the other part of me is like, I want normalcy, normality, normality. There we go. Yeah. Today, I told myself, I'm going to get to work on the homework. It's due for me next week. And I did my makeup for an hour. So, you know, we're all getting back into our own groups at our own pace. <laughs> but make sure it's on pace with your professor's due dates and stuff. <sighs> okay, here we go. I'm going to slam through some of the fun stuff. Slamming is the word I'm using today. Just slamming us in the face right now. I'm sorry. Uh, so we're going to talk about this stuff. Let's go. Normal distribution, also called a Gaussian curve, which means it's time for a historical moment. But we're going to have to be very quick. This guy's name is Johann Karl Frederick Gauss, a German mathematician. He was actually born to really poor parents. They didn't even actually know the date of his birth because they didn't really record things like that. Um, but he was able to figure it out with some context clues. Once the story says, or the legend says, that he was like in class doing something that was like misbehaving according to the teacher. So she said, you add up all the numbers from one through 100, thinking it would take him a while. But because he was so brilliant, he realized that if you add one to 100, you get 101. If you add two to 99, you get 101. So if you keep doing that, you're going to have 50 pairs, basically, that all result in 101. So you can just do 50 times 101, and it's 5,050 is the answer. Smart cookie. Um, and his life was dedicated to learning and its process. He once said it's not knowledge, but the act of learning, not the possession, but the act of getting there, which grants the greatest enjoyment. And this is one of my personal kind of philosophies. I say it a little bit differently. I say, enjoy the process and the product is just a bonus. So I know a lot of you are probably like, I just need to get through college to get my degree, or I just need to get the degree so I can get this job. Or once I get my job and get enough, I can retire and be happy. Like, no, enjoy the process and anything that comes out of it is just a bonus. Like your whole job right now is to learn. That's your whole, I mean, some of you might have part-time jobs, good for you. And I'm sorry that you have to work so much, but uh, many of you, your job is just to learn, enjoy it. Because once you graduate, I've been in the real world and you're like, oh man, I kind of missed that. I'm like nostalgic for it. One more historical moment that I find fun. She's not really related to statistics, but we have Sophie, uh, Maria Sofia Hedmin. But, so Gauss, along with a few other people, were corresponding back in the day in the 1700s and 1800s, were corresponding with what they thought was Auguste Anton Leblanc, which was a pseudonym that Miss Sophia Hemin actually was using so she could correspond with these people because she was incredibly smart. But if you're a woman at the time, you know, nobody's going to take you seriously. So she wrote in a pen name and uh, was pretty much corresponding with a lot of the mathematical like elites. But uh, she was somewhat recognized before she died, but, you know, history, it's written by men, so. But she's cool, so, Sophia had men. Did I just dab? Is that dabbing? I don't know. Okay, normal distribution, now onto the important stuff. Here's our normal distribution. What is this again? What do we have on the x-axis here? We have height of women. And what is this, though? What's on the y-axis? I need you all to participate fast today, or else you're going to have to watch the rest of this video on your own. I'm sorry. What is on the y-axis for these? It's not frequency in this case. Frequency is for what kind of data? Well, we can also do it for this, but this is not frequency. Here we have something up. Proportion, which is basically, another word for proportion is probability. So, <laughs> so it's the probability. So here we have different heights. What is the probability that one woman is about 4'11", or 59 inches? And that's like right here. I can't see it either because it's incredibly small, but it's teeny tiny. I think it's like 3%. Or said another way, what percent of the population is about 4'11"? And this is what we're going to need this curve for. We're going to say 
What's the probability of somebody being 5-4? What's the probability of being greater than 5-4? What's the probability of being less than 5-4? These are the questions we're going to be asking a lot now for statistics, and we're going to need this to help us. Uh, so remember with proportions, which can be interpreted as probabilities, it's basically like uh, percentages or in percent and probabilities, and, sorry, proportions are in decimal form. For your R assignments and your quizzes, I need you all to be mindful of rounding. I'm not going to be as lenient this time. I had a lot of people kind of messing up the rounding two digits, y'all, um, if it's a decimal. And be very careful that if you were to say, if it's 0.01 is the proportion, what is that percentage? 0 0.01 or 0 0.01, what is that in percent? 0 0.01, this is exactly what I mean, that y'all need to be careful. It's one. But if you were to say like, oh, well, you thought of it as a percent, and you said one, that's not a proportion. You just have to be very mindful. I think I'm always asking for proportion in your quizzes, so just be very careful with that. Okay, so in this example, we're looking again at women's height. What was the average height for women? I think about 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, somewhere right here. So we were asking, what is the probability that somebody is about 4'11"? If we look right here, eh, it's about 3%, so 0 0.03, the proportion equals about 3%. So 3% chance that if I were to close my eyes and just point at one of you in Zoom, even though there's not very not very many of you here, but like if I were to just like go into the, go to HEB, HEB for president, um, and I were to just point at some female, what is the probability that she is 4'11"? If I just go like this and point at one of the females in the class, what's the probability that that female is 4'11"? 0.03 is the proportion, or we can say 3%. Very good. Very good, thank you all for interacting, I really appreciate it. So why the hell do we care? Which I'm sure a lot of you all are asking right now, especially because you're like coming back out of shock. PTSD, by the way, after all of this is kind of real. Like somebody was saying it's like the universe is gaslighting us because then it was all beautiful yesterday and everything was fine. So we're just kind of like whiplash. So why do we care? Statistics and most of life has a lot of uncertainty, especially due to like sampling error, measurement error, just the nature of sampling a subset, right? If I wanted to know what the average level of stress, again, for all college students, university students in the US, I can't ask all, however many million, they're probably, stop flickering. I can't ask however many millions of students are out there, I have to take a sample, right? And then from that sample, I have to make my kind of prediction. So we're always dealing with uncertainties and statistics, this is a weird thing to say, but we never prove anything. We're only ever providing evidence for one thing or the other usually. So we, if you ever hear somebody say like the statistics proved it, it's like, mm, they probably really provided a lot of evidence for one thing or the other, but statistics don't necessarily prove things. It's a little syntactical thing that people get a little up in arms about. So why do we care uh, about the probability of certain things or about the, how much evidence there is for something? So how likely is it that we see a woman who's 4'11 or 6'2? I mean, that's not very interesting, but maybe how likely is it that Flint, Michigan's water is contaminated with lead? That's a little bit more interesting. How likely is it that UT will be having in-person classes in the fall? I think that's pretty interesting to all of us. According to my boss, who's into epidemiology, she thinks that we will in the fall. We'll find out soon. Um, what's the likelihood that you'll catch COVID? <laughs> What's the likelihood you'll make an A in this class? And after you do your R assignment number two, hopefully you'll know that it's a fairly high probability. So things like the normal distribution can help us quantify some of these uncertainties. Okay, so remember that's what our curve is doing. Our curve is gonna, t in that curve are people. Let's go back over here one more time. We'll keep drilling this home. So in here, this is the most average height. So there's a lot, like each, think of it like a, this whole bar is filled with a bunch of women who are about 5'4". This bar is filled with a bunch of women who are about 5'5". Five five. These are all like people, and we can get the proportion, so the total number of all of these 5'4 women divided by all the women gives you our proportion. So that's what this curve is telling us. Like, what is that probability of seeing those people? I'm gonna keep on coming back to that. So now, we have to standardize some numbers. This 
is we are going to use this for the rest of the class. So please don't try to just go, oh, I got through that quiz, now I can move on. You need, you need this for the rest of the class. So here is, again, that lovely distribution with all the women's heights. But what if I want to see a distribution of some other variable that's not in inches or whatever the height was? Or what if I don't really care about your actual height? Like, I don't care exactly how many feet or inches you are. But I want to know in relation to other females if you're kind of tall or kind of short. So how do we reduce it down or translate to just the, like, important core bits of the information. We are going to standardize with Z, the Z scale. We can take any scale and we can transform it into this simplified standardized scale that pretty much anybody who's in statistics and things like that, we're all familiar with this and we all know what it says. But if you told me that your score on something was 92, or it's an even weirder number, like 163, was that, a, was that good? Was that bad? I have no idea. I don't know what your scale was. I don't know what the maximum was. I don't know what the average was. I have no idea. Standardized scales kind of get rid of that. I don't have to be acquainted with your scale. I can just use the standardized one. So what we're going to do is we're going to take your score, like your height or your grade in this class, and we're going to transform it into the standardized z-score that everybody understands. So a z-score tells you how many standard deviations a person is away from the mean. Now that might sound a little weird, but hopefully we're going to look at more examples and then it'll start to make more sense. This is not the most intuitive thing, I know, I'm sorry, but it's incredibly beneficial and useful and once you grasp this, it's fabulous. Okay, we have the z-scale and a z-score associated with it and this is going to help us to make comparisons across different types of scales. Because if you were to, what if somebody measures their height in centimeters, somebody else measures it in inches, somebody else in meters, like all these different things. So it's kind of hard to compare them all without transforming them all. But if they were all in z-score, we could look at them all and compare them all together. Ouch. You hear the little bell? Come on, kitty. We all need moral support. No, she's not into it. She'll be here in a little bit. Okay. Here is, I mean, this curve has a lot of stuff going on here, but this is what we're looking at right here, these z-scores. So, very important, the z-scale has a mean of zero, and I know this sounds weird, but hopefully when we do the calculation, it'll make a little bit more sense. The mean is gonna be zero, and the standard deviation is one. So if we look right here, here is our mean of zero, right? Because the mean is always the middle of the hump. All the five, four girls are right here. Okay, so we have our mean, and that's gonna be zero, oh sorry, right here is zero. And then we have a plus one standard deviation, plus two standard deviations, et cetera, because our standard deviations in the standardized scale are one. Excuse me. Why are you flickering? Okay, so there's a lot going on with this curve, and that's because I actually deleted, like, where I got rid of, there's even more stuff down here. but. There's a lot of numbers, they're all stacked on top of each other, but what's important to realize here, and with numbers in this, this whole translating and standardizing, is that all these different numbers are saying the same thing. They're just saying it in a slightly different language. So one is saying it in Spanish, one says it in French, one says it in Russian. But they're all saying the same thing. So here is an example. If I look right here, let's say I'm, I'm looking at female's height again, so I have 5.4. That's the original raw scale. The first thing that we measured your actual height in, let's say in feet and inches. So it's right here. What is the mean if I were to standardize women's height? It would be zero. And we're also looking at like, it's basically the 50th percentile. So 50% of women are above 5'4", 50% below. Actually, it's not exactly that because most women are 5'4", but it'll make more sense in a second here. But all of these numbers correspond to each other. Okay, we're gonna, every time that I show you these curves with the standardized scale, I'm also gonna show you the raw scale. When I say raw scale, I mean the original scale that you measured something in. So if you measured height in inches, the raw scale is in inches. If you measured in feet, the raw scale is in feet. If you measured uh, your weight in pounds, the raw scale is pounds. 
So we're going to be constantly going from raw to standardized. So let's use an example that maybe some of you all have some triggering from the SAT. Or those of you who are going to be taking the GRE soon. Have fun. So how do we actually go about taking a scale like height or intelligence or your SAT score and turning it into this nice, clean, simplified Z-score that everybody can kind of interpret? We need to know a few things. So we're going to need the mean. And this is of a population because we're going to, for some reason, pretend that we have sampled all the women and know that the true height is 5'4". Because after you sample to a certain extent, people can treat it as a known. So, so we need the mean, the standard deviation, and the score of interest. So that person's score, that particular individual, that you want to translate their score into standardized. You want their height or their SAT score in the Z-score. So here is the actual formula and equation. You will have to do this a little bit for your quiz. So we have to standardize, right? We're going to take your raw score. So let's say that uh, we're doing the SAT. You got a 1,000. Uh, wait, no. Let's say you got a 1,200 and the raw score, is that right? 1,200 and then minus the mean, let's say 1,000. I think that's what it is. And then we would divide by the standard deviation. What the hell does that mean? So here is the raw score, right? And we're taking away the mean. So what are we left with? What's going to be on top? It's just going to be the difference, right? Because I don't really care that most women are about 5'4". I can get rid of that. I want to know how much taller or how much shorter you are than that. That's more interesting because, yeah, most people are about 5'4". So let's remove that and only look at the differences because that's where the interesting meat and potatoes is for, for statistics. So we're going to basically get the difference, how much your score differs from the mean. So whatever we're left with here is how much higher or lower you are than the mean. Then we're going to divide by the standard deviation. Why? So every time you divide, divide anything, what you're doing is taking the top number and translating it into this scale. So into the standard deviation scale, basically. So let's look at this in action. There you go. So the z-scores you can see here are basically like they correspond very well to the standard deviation. So negative one times that standard deviation value. And then here we just have that z-score of one. See in a second here. Okay, so let's actually like do something. So we're going to convert some raw scores into z-scores. These are all SAT made up scores and uh, so every year, unfortunately, like the percentiles and everything for SATs change. So if a lot of smart people take the SAT one year, percentiles are going to be harder to achieve. It'll make sense in a sec, I hope. So the data have been modified a little bit, but they're fairly close to 2019 SAT data. Not that anybody cares. So we have an average score of 1,000 and a standard deviation of 210 points. So let us take the first person's score and let's transform it. So we have this 1555. We're going to subtract 1000. So we're left with 555555. Five, five, five. <laughs> and that is the difference, right? They did that much better than the mean. But again, it's still 555. Five, five. Is that really big? Is that really small? I'm not completely sure. So let's standardize it now. This is the standardizing part. We're going to divide by the standard deviation. And what we end up with is 2.64. Now what the heck does that mean? We're going to put it on the curve here in a second. But let's go and do, actually here's a question for you. So this one is positive, right? We have a positive 2.64. Do you think this one is going to be negative or positive? The score was 980, and we're going to subtract 1,000, divide by 210. Are they going to have a positive or a negative z-score? It's going to be negative, right? They did worse than the average, OK? Very good. So here are all the rest of them. Oh my goodness, that's not correct, is it? This is not correct. Oh my god, I can't believe I didn't catch that at some point. <laughs> My bad. So this is supposed to be zero. Oh my lord. I have been teaching these slides for a while now. I need a note for myself. I'll try to remember. This should be zero. Why is it zero? Why would this one have a z-score of zero? 
Exactly. They have exactly the mean, right? They scored exactly the mean, so they're exactly in the mean. So they have a zero z-score. Mm, okay, so you converted them all, but now knowing what you know, so you don't know, let's say that you don't have the person's actual score, but I told you that somebody got a negative three z-score on their SAT. Do you think they're going to get into college? <laughs> That's a funny face. What can you tell from that negative three? Is it really good, really bad? I don't know. It's not too good. It's actually really bad. So we're going to see that z scores tend to range kind of from like negative three to positive three. They, can, they technically go into infinity. It's just that we don't see them. So what this tells us, you can take a z score and go convert it back into the raw score. So if you knew that somebody had a z score of negative three, that actually means that they got a 370 on the SAT, which is actually not possible. Apparently it goes down to 400, but really low, pretty bad. What if I told you that somebody got a positive three as their z score? They're getting into Harvard. <laughs> They're getting into Princeton or something, right? I see. There you go. You get 400 for just putting your name on it. Yeah, there must be some weird cap. <laughs> okay, so now, now that you can kind of see how we take your raw score, we can translate it into Z, and now everybody understands how a Z works, at least people who have acquaintance with this, like stats people. Now we can put it here. So with our SAT example, we had a score of 1,000. They were exactly the average, right? 1,000 minus 1,000 divided by who cares what is still going to be zero, right? So they have a z-score of zero. Uh, somebody who got a 1210 has a z-score of one. 1420, z-score of two, and respectively downward. So this is how we're mapping it. So um, do we have more people that get 1210s or more people that get 580s? I will answer that in just a second, uh, Lexi. Do we have more people that score 1210 or 580? Very good. How did you all figure that out? Because there, if they think about a bunch of people stacked on top of each other, I know that sounds weird, but I, for a long time when I was learning about this curve, I never really put together, it's like there's people basically in there. We're getting the percent of people or the proportion. So here at 1210, we have quite a few people here technically. Over here, we don't have as much. It's a more extreme score. Because what are most people scoring on the SAT? What is the main score, the most average score? 1,000, exactly. So most people are going to score between this 790 and 1,210. Most people. And actually here it even tells us how much, 68%. We're going to look at this in just a second. But this is what we're doing with the z-score. We're taking this raw score and your SAT or whatever scale it is, and we're going to transform it into this simplified z-score that again ranges between about negative three to positive three, but it can get much higher or much lower than that. Um, so here I'm taking some of the, we had a few observations, these are the scores that we had, and I'm like putting them basically on the curve. So here is that really low score, here is that super high score. This is how you would translate back and forth. I'm not going to make you do this, but if ever you take an advanced stats class, they'll probably make you do this. So if I were to give you a z-score, I would want you to convert it to a raw score. You would just have to do some algebra, rearranging the formulas, but I'm pretty sure I don't make you do that. Okay, so the first part of your quiz is going to be a lot about calculating these z-values. Then the second part, there's going to be like three main parts. Second part is about figuring out how many people are in certain parts of the curve. So from that normal distribution, we had in here, there's some more numbers. What the heck are all those numbers? What does this 34 mean? Any guesses? I mean, it says on the board, but you know, in your own words, on the board. What does this 34% mean?
Very good, exactly. The amount of people, the percentage of people who scored within that certain set. From what range to what other range? From zero to one. Now what about from zero to negative one? What percent of people score in that range? From zero to negative one. It's the exact same, very good. Remember, it's a symmetrical distribution, so what happens on one side happens on the other. Okay, How what percent of people, I know it's teeny tiny, what percent of people score between a negative two and a negative three z-score? Approximately, I know it's really tiny, I'm sorry. Oh good, it's big enough, I guess, for some of you. Yeah, about 2.14, about 2% in here. So very low probability, right, of people getting a score here. Much higher probability of people getting a score around here, which makes sense, right? If we're looking at our SAT score, most people are gonna score near the average in here. They're gonna be either a little bit above it or a little bit below it. Then we're gonna have some people who are kind of above average, some are a little bit below average, some that are way above average and some that are way below average. Okay, so because this wonderful curve is standard, as long as your data follows a normal distribution, which the data we're looking at do, um, for actual statistics, you'd have to do certain little tests to make sure that that's true, but we're gonna assume it's true for this class. So what percent of people <coughs> score between negative one and positive one standard deviations? How many people are within a standard deviation from the mean, basically? 68%, but notice how I said that too. Some of the questions I write it that way, and I know it can kind of confuse people. If I were to say what proportion or what percent of people are between, are within, I should say, within two standard deviations from the mean? What's the answer to that one? What percent or proportion of people are within two standard deviations from the mean? Very good, 95%. Sometimes people think I'm saying from the middle to the end. Like you have to be careful. A lot of the questions I'm gonna ask you on your quiz are gonna say from like negative three to the mean or from negative three to positive two. And you just have to add up the chunks. But be aware of where I'm asking you from like from one point out or from one point forward or one point backward. That tends to trip people up, I've noticed. I also recommend drawing the curve. Later on in this class, I am going to I'm gonna say it a million times, to always draw the curve and so you can stay oriented. So, and then we have 68 between negative one and one, 95 between negative two and two, and 99.7 between negative three and three. And so that like, there's like 0.3% out here and out here somewhere, like it's out there. You could technically get a Z-score of like 100. It's just probably an outlier <laughs> or something really crazy. So, one more time, what percent of people score between 790 and 1210 on the SAT? 65%, uh, excuse me, 68, 68%, I'm sorry. 68%. And then people that score between 580 and 1420, 95%, and then the last one. Okay, so here, and remember, your quizzes are open note, of course, so you can have this kind of stuff pulled out, and I recommend you do. So if I were to ask you, what percent of people score between, see here we have actually that negative four, let's say negative four to uh, positive two. So from negative four to positive two, what percent of people score within there, roughly? Don't have to, you don't have to do it by the decimal here, just roughly. So basically from right here, sorry, all the way down. About 98%, exactly. And the quickest way to do that is just, you can take one and subtract this part rather than having to add up all of these. But it's fine to add them all up. If that's how your brain thinks, do not worry about it. So here are again the rough estimates, like between Three and negative four, we have about 0.1%, it's actually a little bit more than that. Between negative three and negative two, about 2%, and then 14%, and then 34%. Again, all, all, 
all approximate. This is basically what I just asked you to do, right? I just asked you from right here all the way down, about 98%. For your quiz, I might ask you from here that way. Works the same way. You're still going to be adding up. Okay, so z-scores, being able to calculate them, and being able to play with this curve. If I were to say how many people score between negative 3 and positive 1, you would add up everything from right here to right here. Okay? Okay, z-scores, percentiles, and probability. This is now the third aspect of that quiz. So you have a z-score. That's great. And I can tell you if I said that somebody's z-score was 2.5, did they do good or bad? Assuming that high scores means good. Their, their z-score was 2.5. They did good. But how good? Like, how many people, what percent of people do you think they did better than? A score of 2.5. I want you all to kind of try to feel this intuitively before you just start slamming into the, again with the word slam, slamming into these tables because you're going to get confused if you're not thinking about what you're actually looking up. So if somebody had a z-score of 2.5, everybody's kind of agreeing that they did good. How good? How many, what percent of people did they score higher than? Basically, what's their percentile? Ooh, very good. So I'm having some people saying over 95%. Well, how did, she, how did she figure that out so quickly? Well, we know that if their z-score was greater than 2, what percent up here is left? Less than like 3%. So they scored better than like 90-some percent of people. So in this example, it was hopefully kind of intuitive. I, a lot of people get tripped up with this, and they'll forget which side we're looking at. So if I were to ask you, somebody got a z-score of negative um, 1.5. How bad did they do? How many people did they do better than? If they got a negative 1.5, so about right here. Roughly, how many people did they do better than? So basically all this down here. about 9%. Very good, exactly. So that is what we're kind of looking for. Now you all are just kind of guesstimating, which is good. I want you before you answer problems to really think about it for a second. Because I've had so many people I'll say, what's the probability that a woman is over six feet tall? And people will still somehow answer 70%, 65%. I'm like, we know the average is 5'4". There's no way that there's going to be more than 50% of women that are six feet tall. But we'll see more examples. Okay, so y'all were kind of guesstimating. I want you to do that before you approach these problems. I want you to have a kind of intuitive belly feeling about them before you start looking here. But this is how we're going to find the exact proportion, the exact percentile score, rather than kind of going, eh, it looks like 98%. So now we're going to get the exact number using these horrendous tables that nobody would ever use in real life for statistics. But it's important to start, but you don't technically even need to use the tables. You can use R, and there's videos to show you how to do that. Okay, so remember when you took your SAT or ACT, you got your score, whatever it was. So like SAT had like a 1200, and then S ACT had like 25. You see what I'm saying? That all these stupid scales are in all these different... I have no idea if 25 is good or bad, but if you told me a person's z-score, or if you told me their percentile, which z-scores will tell you, now we have a sense of how good or bad somebody did. So, for example, from our SAT scores, if somebody scored a 1035 on the SAT, their z-score was 0.17. So remember, we take this value, the person's raw score, subtract 1,000, so we end up with 35 divided by, I think, 210 was a standard deviation, and we end up with 0.17. So, what am I asking here? I want the percentile. So, Maybe you already saw the answer, but if somebody has a z-score of 0.17, will their percentile be greater than or less than 50%? Somebody has a z-score of 0.17, positive 0.17, will it be greater than 50% or less than 50%? I have two guesses for greater. Anybody else? Someone's like, nope. 
Good, thank you. Yes, it is greater. How do you know it's greater though? Because, let's go back to our curve over here one more time. If somebody has a score right here, just slightly above the mean, this has to add up to more than 50, right? Because this side's 50%, this side's 50%. So if you're right above it, it's gonna be slightly more than 50%. Exactly, exactly. Very good, because the average is zero or because it's more than that zero. It, maybe some of you are thinking, why should you keep drilling this home? You would be surprised how many people can get turned around and flipped around with this. Now, if somebody had a z-score of negative 1.7, then it's gonna be less than 50th percentile. Okay. So here is that point one seven. Here's our z-score, great. And the actual percentile, or the proportion of people that that person did better than, so like they have a score less than this 1035, is about 56, 57%. Now how did I get that with this hideous table? So <laughs> here we have, this is called the unit normal table or a Z table. We have right here, it's really tough. Oh, I just realized I can probably zoom, can't I? Uh -huh. I don't know why I've never done that before. Very smart. Okay, so right here we have Z values. Now this table goes on up to four. <laughs> so this is a few pages long. It's in Canvas. If you want to use this to answer your quiz questions, you have to go and download the table. I think it's also in the module threes like materials. If not, remind me and I'll post it there, but it's in the files. So here we have Z scores. So we're gonna figure out how many people are either below it or maybe above it or within two values. I hardly, I don't think I ever actually make you do this um, for a computational question, but we'll look at it in just a sec. So here we have some Z values. What is the percentile score for somebody who has a Z score of zero? Fiftieth, they're the fiftieth, and here we go. We have 50% in the body, which I hate this body and tail thing. I'll try to kind of use that vernacular if it's helpful, but here we have 50% basically below it and 50% above it. So in the tail and in the body for a z-score of zero, because, no, it's the mean, it's right in the middle. 50% above, 50% below. Now, for that 0.17 that we had in our example, we would go and look it up right here. 0.17, and we go and find 0.5675, which is that 57th percentile. And a lot of you are already kind of feeling it, like, well, it's greater than zero, so it must be a little bit greater than 50%. But now, if I asked you, what proportion of people did a person with a negative 0.17 z-score, excuse me, what was their percentile rank? Excuse me, if they had, exactly. But how did you figure that one out? Because, fun fact, there is no negative for this table. It's all positives. And this tends to confuse people, but it's because it's symmetrical. We don't need a whole nother chunk of table. We can just use this one now. So if the z-score is negative 0.17, you still look for 0.17, but you know, because it's negative, it can't possibly be greater than 50%, so you must be looking for this one. 43.2, or excuse me, 0.4325. Okay, we're gonna do a few more examples. I know it's kind of like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> but we're gonna have more and more examples of this ad nauseum. Okay, so if you had a z-score of 0.25, what is your percentile rank? I know it's incredibly hard to see. <laughs> and I actually don't remember. But is it gonna be greater than or less than 50%? I'm gonna make you always ask that question. Oh my goodness, my cat is running amok down there. We have somebody saying 60, I really don't know. We're gonna have to check, but it sounds right. It's definitely above 50. Okay, and then for this one, we know this one. What's this one? 50th percentile, very good. Now what's this one? Oh, it's not actually intuitive. <laughs> Just some guesstimates, 0.49, anybody? I don't know if you can see it on this horribly tiny table. Let's find out. Very good, 69 if you round, I think. 
Um, so for 0.25, 60th. For 0.14, 69th. And remember, it's the equivalent of saying that 69% of people scored below you. Or you can say you did better than 69% of people. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm not even going to say that out loud. <laughs> It's just for the people in the chat. <laughs> okay. Yes, Kitty. So what percent scored above you if you had a z-score of 0.49? Why did I already give you the answer? Well, that's not good. <laughs> okay, so it's basically just the complement, right? If you had, here we knew that we had for 0.49, it was 60th percentile to get what people scored above you. Uh, 31% because it has to add up to 1 or I guess percentage has to add up to 100 proportions have to add up to 1 so if ever you get a proportion that is greater than 1 like you get a 1.2 you did something wrong <laughs> okay so what percent of people scored above you had a z-score of 0.25 40% and you can either do 1 minus the body kind of thing for these kind of questions or you can do uh, looking at this tail thing but I always want you to think about when you're looking at a z-score, if it's positive and not zero, well, zero is neither positive or negative. If it's positive, your percentile is going to be greater than 50. If it's negative, your percentile is going to be less than 50. Don't let that trip you up when you're trying to figure out, am I looking at the tail of the body? Just ask yourself first, does it cross the zero? If it doesn't cross zero, meaning it's negative, it's going to be less than 50% for a percentile score. Thank you for the head nods and the affirmations. I appreciate Oh my goodness, my leg. Okay, so if I randomly select somebody, what is the probability they scored above you if you had a z-score of that 0.49, that 0.31? Remember, we already kind of looked at it just a second ago. And same with this one. Another quick thing here, so see this notation? Um, I use it inter here and there, and it's good to familiarize it yourself with. You might see this in the future in other classes, but here it's basically saying probability of somebody's z value being greater than your z value. Oh my lord, jeez. I have like a teeny weeny little landing that my cat, like it, my cat just looked like she jumped off the second floor down to the thing, but she just jumped over there. Okay, we're fine. I think she just jumped all the way down though. Um, so this is basically saying the probability of somebody's z-score being greater than 0.49 or, yeah. Another way you can say this is called p of x or like p of z being less than something. When we say p, we mean probability. Okay, so there are two different instructors teaching statistical literacy. This used to be true, but now it's all me. A student in Z's class had a score of 45 on the first exam. And the student in D's class, uh, they got a different type of exam, but it was still studying the same stuff, but they had multiple choice and I had, I don't know, free response. And they got a score of 50. Who did better? Now, some people might be inclined to say, well, obviously the student in D's class, he got a 50, the other one got a 45. These are different exams. What information do we need? We need the mean. We need to get their z-scores. So to get z-scores, we need the mean, the standard deviation. Very good. So here we go. And actually, I mean, I want you to calculate the z-score. I'll show you in just a second how to do it. But just looking at this information, which one do you think did better? Yep, you can already kind of quickly see that if the mean for Z's exam was 40 and the student got a 45, they did better than the mean. This one, the mean was 55, this person had a score of 50. They did less than the mean. So we already know it's this person, but let's still calculate that Z score. And we see that this person got a plus one and that person got a minus one. So now we can actually compare the two and see that this person did better, even though if you were to have just thought that, oh, okay, 45 and 50, they're on the same scale, who cares? 45 is less than 50, you'd be incorrect. I think on, there might be one or two of these kind of quiz questions. 
two, maybe. Okay. So here is a real world example. I know I have a lot of SLPs in here. Um, and well, speech language pathology for those of you who are not SLPs <laughs> and other language pathology people or anybody who's interested in maybe like special education, things like that. I mean, I know some of you are here because it's a special or it's ed psych. So maybe you're into that kind of stuff or just IQs, whatever. We can take this lovely curve and we can plot everything. So here it looks basically like an IQ test. It's got the same mean and standard deviation. It's an, this like 100 is another kind of standard score that people will sometimes use, but we can also turn it into z-score. So what is the, if you scored one standard deviation above the mean, what would be your raw score in this one, in this particular example? If you had a plus one z-score or a positive one, 115, right? Oh, I should also say, so this is called the self five. It's something they give to kids. And I, I can't remember exactly because I'm not an SLP. I just happened to have taught a class to them. Um, and it's basically a language kind of test. So most kiddos at a certain age should be hitting certain benchmarks, right? And they should be able to say certain things or are picking up kind of like language is amazing and kind of automatic, right? But uh, not for everybody. Sometimes people have problems with that. So. Let's say we have some kiddos and we have some that are scoring well above average and that's all well and good, but we don't really care about those students. They're doing fine. Maybe we need to put them in something gifted, but that's not what this is assessing. Fun fact also, IQs were not invented, IQ tests were not really invented to figure out who is the smartest because I took an IQ test that was five questions online. No, it was really to identify the people who are doing poorly and trying to find those students so you can give them additional services. So here, we don't really care too much about the kiddos that are doing really well at their language acquisition. They're fine. And then we have some here. We have the average, and we have some that are a little bit above average and a little bit below, but it's not really cause for concern. They're still average. They're still all right. Maybe they're just not going to want to read very much when they're older, and that's okay. Then we have another little chunk here that's like below average and maybe kind of mild. And then we have another here that we're saying, ooh, this is really low, like moderately bad. And then here we have very low and severe. So when we're gonna test kiddos, and here's like the respective uh, Z scores basically, it's saying standard deviation. So how many standard deviations away from the mean are you? So let's say that um, you're gonna get a kiddo from somebody they're referring them to you, and they tell you, oh, on the self, they had a Z score of negative 2.2. What would you think? There's cause for concern maybe, and you need to maybe get some intervention in quick. So that's why this is really useful. Like there's gonna be people that score really high and some that score low, but that's fine. People are different and we're all gonna kind of uh, cluster around the mean. That's very normal. But these way down here, that's where we have to start worrying. They like, for a kiddo who got a score of 70, they're only scoring better than 2% of people. And that's, again, in this really bottom range, that's a really low range that needs probably some sort of intervention. They're gonna need some speech language pathology or something like that, some kind of therapy. Okay, so again, why do we do this? So we're translating raw data into standardized scales. And this allows us to interpret any one person's score more deeply and we can also compare it relative to other people and see how they did compared to everybody else. And when it comes to statistics, to statistics, that's what we care about. Like, I know you care about your individual score, maybe, but what do you really care about? Maybe how did you do in comparison to other people? Maybe not in class. In classes you're like, did I pass or did I get the A? I don't care how, if I'm doing better than everybody else. But for those kind of exams that are basically, your percentile is based on how everybody else did, you probably want to know how you did in relation to everybody. So again, a z-score of positive two would tell you that somebody did really well. Even if you didn't know anything about the raw score, like even if you didn't know the IQ or the self or whatever I said, like I just told you, this kiddo got a positive two and let's say positive scores are good. You'd be like, they're fine. But if I said somebody had a negative two, you'd be like, ooh, maybe this kiddo needs some intervention, some therapy, because the earlier the better. So the conversion of that data to have this mean of zero with a standard deviation of one, it makes computations and interpretations a lot easier. 
And this translated kind of data is at the core of what we're going to be doing. Some of you probably remember like a p-value. This is going to relate to that. We're going to get there in the next few classes. Okay, yeah, I've heard that before too, that some teachers say I'm only going to give out a certain number of A's. That is this really weird sliding scale, which I do not agree with at all, because you're just saying like, well, you didn't do, even though you've got all the material, you didn't do as good as this person, so I'm going to give you a lower grade, which is, I find terribly unfair, but I'm sorry, it's not my class. So again, why are we doing this? We can take any scale, simplify it, standardize it to this wonderful Z, and once we have the Z, we can figure out probabilities, because can you imagine that Z table already is kind of daunting. Imagine if you had one of those for every single variable of interest. You have one for height, one for women's height, one for men's height, one in centimeters, one in meters, one for weight. One. It would be endless. We don't need that. We can take whatever scale you have, as long as it's normal data, and we can transform it into a z-score and figure out the probabilities. Okay, then we're going to look at the z-test. That's how we do it in R. There's videos that show you that. I want to do, we have 15 more minutes because I really ran through that. I'm very sorry, but I want to show you one more thing. It's like a little spoiler from the next, um, Chimadilly, the next thing. Uh, any questions, comments before I quickly pull this up? How are y'all feeling? Was that horribly fast and confusing and uncomfortable? I'm sorry. Thankfully, it's recorded, right? You can watch it again. But if you need to watch any of this again to kind of familiarize yourself, really, I would recommend watching the pre-recorded ones that are already on YouTube because those are much more concise and succinct and I don't pause to ask for questions and stuff like that. So you can get through that quicker and it's a little bit better of a summary. That's not the one I want. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so this is just like me gonna quickly, quickly, quickly go over what you're gonna learn in the pre-recorded video on YouTube, but I do wanna show you one cool, I think cool thing cool example that I'm sad to lose. Hello. Come on, OBS. Here we go. Okay. So we were doing these z-score things, right, for one person, and then we had our unit normal table and all that. But now again, you're going to look at all this stuff slowly in the video. But remember, what's the probability of seeing one woman who is taller than, let's say, 68 inches? And that is 5'8". Uh, so do you think that's a high or a low pro Do you think it's going to be greater than 50%? Is the probability of seeing one woman who is 5'8 or taller is somebody saying no? So it's going to be less than 50%, right? Because if here's the mean, and we're going to have... <laughs> I just look like a little floating head. And here we have 68 maybe. We're asking this area, so it's certainly less than 50%, okay? So you'll figure that out, and we're going to say their z-score is 0.86. The probability is going to be about 0.19. So a 20, uh, like a 1 in 5 chance, 20% chance of seeing a girl who is 5'8 or taller, okay? Now that's between... And that's the space between. Okay, so what we just did in this first PowerPoint that I just went over is we're calculating one person's z-score. All well and good. And when you do take a test, you want to know your percentile and your z-score. But in statistics, do we care about any one person? No. We want a mean, right? We're talking about averages, a group of people. So now we're going to switch from getting a z-score for one person to a, basically a z-value, kind of more of a z-test, for a group of people. So it's going to look very similar. Here is your z-score formula, and here is your z-statistic. The only thing that's changing here is instead of, it's still going to be a raw score, so like 5-4 maybe, still going to be a raw value, but it's going to be the average for your entire sample of people, not just one person. And because of that, we are also going to divide this standard deviation by the square root of n. I know it sucks, it's ugly, but just keep this pulled out for your questions. And that's also called standard error. We're going to talk, oh, I'm sorry if that was loud. We're going to talk more about that um, next week. Standard error is a really important thing. Okay, this is our new distribution, 
It's going to be a distribution of means. It'll make more sense in the video and um, in next week's lecture. What I really want to show you, OK, so what's the probability of observing one woman who's about 5'8 or taller? It was about a 19% chance. But now if the average height of women is 65 inches, the standard deviation is 3.5, how likely is it that I collect a sample of five people and calculate a mean, an entire mean, a mean of five people that's greater than 68 inches? Now just think about this. The probability of seeing one of you in my class being 6'8 or taller, 20% chance. What's the probability that I select five of you and take your average and it's greater than 68%? Very good. Somebody's already said it's going to be lower than 20. How much lower? Do you think it's going to be dramatically lower? <laughs> so here's what we're looking at now. So we're moving from this idea of just one to a group. Now if you go and calculate that, these are important notes to just look back at. If you go and calculate that, there we go. We have a 3% chance. So it went from 20% to 3%. You see how that likelihood or that probability went way down really fast? And that was just five people. If you were to have a sample of 100, there'd probably be this big of a chance. It'd be teeny, teeny, tiny. Now the one I really want to get at, all this will be great for you to watch in the video, but I really want this example is the one I really like. So Flint, Michigan water. Y'all remember that? Remember how a lot of lead and contamination? So how do we test if Flint, Michigan's water is contaminated with lead? What do we need to know? What do we need to ask? So what are some of the things we need to know and ask to figure out if this particular city's water has too much lead? Because, spoiler, water has a teeny tiny amount of lead in it probably. It's just like trace amounts that are not going to be dangerous, sort of. So what information do we need to figure out if it's too high? Other towns' lead levels. So what is that basically? In stats terms, what is the word I'm looking for? Does it taste funky? We need the average, the standard deviation. So we want to know, um, so some cities, of course, might have more or less lead than others, you know, just by variation, some older cities or something. We need to know the average, the standard deviation, how many samples were taken from Flint, Michigan water. Was it just one pipe or was it hundreds of buildings in their pipes and what is the average amount of lead that we found in those pipes from Flint, Michigan. So these are all real numbers except for this one. This is the only number I couldn't find and I just kind of made it up for the sake of this example. So don't use the, don't cite this in any other class. But uh, EPA says that the average amount or the average amount of lead that is like Okay, is 2.8 parts per billion. Anything over 15 parts per billion is action level, meaning that like, gotta throw some people in there to clean things up. Um, and then what's the average amount of difference between different cities and their lead levels? I'm gonna say 1.5. And how many Flint, Michigan water samples were taken? I was able to find this online. There were 269 samples uh, total. They didn't report an overall average. This kind of pissed me off, but. I, again, worked with it for this example. 269 samples, or excuse me, yeah, 269 samples, no overall average was found, but we know from what they reported, 40% of those samples, so that's 101, were over five parts per billion. Like, okay, that's almost double, or yeah, it's almost double the average, according to the EPA, but it's less than that um, action level, 15 parts per billion. But the top 10%, the 90th percentile, basically, there was 27 samples that had an average of 25. And then we had an, a few outliers, I think there were five or six, that had over 100 parts per billion. So, and one of them exceeded 1,000, which really, really high. So let's take these numbers. So assuming that the water is not contaminated, what's the probability that you see one water sample, just one, one pipe, not the average, with the lead concentration greater than five parts per billion. I'm just picking five parts per billion because it seems mildly high. I mean, it's almost twice the uh, average by the EPA. Um, considering that the mean is 2.8 with a known standard deviation of 
So if you go and get that z-score for just one pipe, this is a very important distinction, this is just one building's water sample, we have a 7% chance of seeing water, uh, lead in the water greater than five parts per billion, which, I mean, it's possible, right? There is a 7% chance and could just be chance and it's just one sample. So now, how different do you think Oh, wait, oh, assuming that all the water is fine, that there is a 7% chance of seeing one sample greater than five parts per billion, it's not impossible or completely unlikely. Some pipes might just be really old or particularly leady. But now I want you to think, assuming, this is important, I'm gonna keep drilling this home, it's gonna be part of hypothesis testing. Assuming that the water is fine, because most of the time water is fine. Assuming the water is fine, what's the probability of seeing an average of, from multiple water samples greater than five parts per billion. Now you already kind of thought of this with the height, seeing one woman who is 5'8 or taller, not super unlikely, 20% chance, seeing a whole group of women, chances go down. So let's see how much these two are gonna vary. From a 7% chance for one pipe, let's see how much that's gonna change for our samples. So I only took the 101 samples that they reported the uh, what was it that was like five point something or something like that? If we go and do that, because now this is not just one pipe anymore. Now we have 101 samples. We are now getting a Z test value. So this is for an entire group. The Z value is 14.74. So what's the probability? Teeny, tiny. I should say, even though it says, like I rounded to three decimal places here, even though it says zero, there is a teeny tiny, way over there, a teeny tiny probability down there. It's not zero all the way down. There is a number after a bunch of zeros, but for our intents and purposes, it's zero. Also, as a side note, after I first did and recorded all this, I went back and did something else because I only used 101 samples because that subset from the report that I found had an average. But it's not appropriate in an analysis to just grab the ones that have an average or the ones that you know, or just picking high values, that would be a big no-no. But this is really for the example. But I also, after that example we just saw, I decided to like try to actually recreate the data. So here I'm gonna say, and this is all based on the numbers that they reported. So a conservative assumption, I'm gonna say that 138 samples were zero. But then we're gonna say that 76 samples were five, 27 samples were 25, three were 100, and I completely threw out that one that was over 1,000 because it was, I mean, it might be a true value, but it was such a crazy outlier. And what happens to the mean? It gets pulled, so I threw it out. I actually was like, you know what? I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna give it the benefit of the doubt. And so I have a total sample of 268 with 138 of those being zero, but all the rest of them you know, are getting higher. Um, this resulted in a mean of 5.06 parts per billion, so it's still very close, the five or greater, we're still trying to look for that. If you plug that in, the resulting Z statistic, not a problem, Z statistic is 24.67. Remember, when we were looking at the curve, most things fall between negative three, four to positive three, four, so this is ridiculously extreme. So in this case, would you conclude, do you think that there is uh, do you think it's a fluke that maybe you just so happened to, out of 101 water samples, you just kept accidentally sampling really, really leady pipes? But it was just those leady pipes. All the rest of the pipes are fine. How likely do you think that is? Not terribly likely. This is the essence of hypothesis testing. We're going to take a sample. We're going to see how likely is it that we see this number if we know that this is the true average for the rest of the population, how likely is it we see an average this high considering all of these lovely things? So I really like this example because it's a very real world one and this is what we have to do because there's going to be plenty of politicians going, no, no, the water's fine, the water's fine. It's like, no, it's not. The evidence says otherwise. <sighs> okay, with that, I'm going to let you obviously watch the rest of this video by yourself. Again, it's about 30 minutes. If you have the time, I would watch it, oops, watch it now. Or if you want to discuss or practice some problems right now, I'm happy to. I will be here until um, six. Otherwise, have a good day. It's the weekend. <laughs>
So take care of yourselves. Please hit me up if you need anything. I'll figure out if I'm going to do that extra credit and everything and just check your announcements. Otherwise, have a wonderful weekend, y'all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.